Hi everyone and welcome to part two of Fun with Thermal. In our first video we looked at some of the fun things we could do with a thermal camera. We looked at some of its truisms and some of the myths that were also associated with thermal video. But at the end of the day we all know that a thermal camera is the ultimate detection tool. Whether it be for critical infrastructure, monitoring a city, looking at animals, monitoring a perimeter or a border, or just looking at your own hand. Thermal cameras have very unique features that allow you to do some very cool things. In this video, we're going to use the same camera that we used in part one, our 10 millimeter bispectrum, but we're going to introduce to you a 100 millimeter thermal only bullet camera, the DS-2TD 2366 100. This thermal camera has very high end features. Let's take a look at the data sheet and point out just a few characteristics that are important. Let's note that this thermal camera comes with three different lens options, either 50 millimeter, 75 millimeter, or 100 millimeter lens. It boasts 640 by 512 resolution, which in the thermal world is extremely high, vanadium oxide uncooled focal plane, and NETD of less than 40 millikelvin. NETD stands for noise equivalent temperature difference, especially when we have large variances in temperature on the screen. It's what makes the picture look even better. The lower the number, the better the picture. Adaptive AGC, 3D noise reduction, dynamic detail enhancement, built-in VCA such as line crossing, intrusion, region entrance and exit, temperature exception, and advanced fire detection. 15 different color palettes. It includes the Contuit base, it's IP66, and works on PoE 802.3 AT, 24 volts AC, or 12 volts DC at eight watts. The second page of the data sheet gives you all the detailed specifications. Download it from hikevision.com and take a look at all the different specifications and range performance. So for this fun with thermal video, I wanted to do something a little bit different, maybe something you've never seen before. And I happened to notice that there was a ULA, United Launch Alliance rocket, uh, getting ready to take off from Cape Canaveral, which is about uh, 90 miles from my house. And I decided that uh, I would try to capture that with my pair of thermal cameras. Uh, this was a Delta IV rocket, not the largest rocket in the world. You have four solid rocket boosters and a main engine as well. But before I could just go out and record this, I had to take a few different things into consideration to make sure I was going to capture something good because, let's face it, I was only going to get one shot at it. So I took my 100 millimeter thermal camera outside one evening and decided to play around with the focus adjustment on it. The 10 millimeter bispectrum has no focus adjustment. What I found was by going into configuration under image and then under focus, there were three different focus modes, auto, manual, and semi-auto. And I wanted to find out what each one of them would actually do. So autofocus was pretty simple. The camera actually autofocuses. Now that works fine in the near field, say with large objects or objects that are going to be in the center of the screen. But for what I was going to be doing up at the uh, rocket launch, uh, I just didn't think it was going to actually work. So you can see how I focused it on a car that was in the near field. I start to raise the camera up towards uh, some wooded area down the road just a little bit. And it sort of focused on the midfield. And uh, if I had raised it up a little further, it would have focused even more on the far field as the far field took over the screen. The next option I uh, decided to check out was just manual focus. And to do manual focus, we go back into the live view. And while you're in the live view, you have to open up the controls on the right hand side of the screen. There's a small little red tab that you're going to click on and that'll bring all your controls on screen for you. And then when you look at the focus controls, there's a focus near and a focus far uh, based on the way the icon is driven. Focus far, focus near, and you can manually adjust the focus. Now, of course, once you manually focus it, if you move the camera, then it's not necessarily going to be in focus depending on what object it is that you're actually trying to look at. So I move up from the car that was in focus to the trees and it was out of focus. And the only way I'm going to get that back into focus is to manually focus it because I'm in manual focus mode. We'll go back to configuration and we'll take a look at semi automatic. Now watch closely as I click on semi-automatic, the image actually starts to focus automatically. That's the semi portion of it. But once I go back into the live view and I'm going to pan down just a little bit to that near field vehicle, 
I'm going to open up my focus controls and now I can manually focus the camera. So sort of in essence think of the semi-automatic as it does the initial job for you and then you could make focus adjustments as necessary. But once you make those focus adjustments, the camera is basically in manual mode at that point. So as you can see, as I start to tilt up, it does not automatically focus. So semi-automatic gets it started. And then once I manually focus, I will need to continue to manually focus. I would think that for most perimeter type detection applications, autofocus is going to be perfectly suitable. So at this point, I'm going to tilt the camera up towards the moon and I'm going to use the manual focus procedure that I showed you earlier and focus the camera onto the moon. Now the moon's 238,900 miles from the earth, but this rocket is going to be 15 nautical miles away from me and traveling away from me once the launch occurs. And I want to have the best chance of getting an in focus thermal image from the rocket's thermal signature. In the configuration tab under image VCA rule display, we can set the colors for normal pre-alarm and alarm thermal detection. I have them all set to white since I'm using a color palette. Speaking of color palettes under configuration image, image enhancement, you can choose from the different palettes that are available. White hot, black hot, fusion one, rainbow, Fusion 2, Rainbow 1, etc. I'm going to click through the different ones here so that you can see some differences in the color palettes. Now, obviously, the palette that you want to choose will be dependent upon the application in which you're using this thermal camera. As I continue to click through the different palettes, you'll also notice your DDE setting and your DDE level and a myriad of other configuration areas that you can tweak again depending on the actual application for the camera certainly we can't go through each of those settings within this video but just know that within the configuration section you have total control over manual configuration of the camera so now i'm going to show you the launch as i captured it with my 10 millimeter and 100 millimeter cameras as well as i've overlaid the live broadcast they're not exactly time synchronized but they're pretty close you can see in the visible camera right now, it looks just like a big ball of light, but on both of the thermal cameras, both the 10 millimeter in the lower right and the 100 millimeter in the upper right, we see a very distinct thermal signature and even the trailing uh, heat trail behind the rocket. Now the interesting thing, I didn't notice it at first until I was watching the video later, is we were actually able to capture all four of the solid rocket boosters as they separated from the main engine. Now we'll see that coming up in about, uh, I don't know, 30 or 40 seconds from now. Um, but do take notice that the visible camera, once the rocket sort of gets into more of a profile view, uh, instead of just seeing a bright round light, you'll actually start to see the trail behind the rocket as it's heading downrange a little bit more. In the lower left hand corner in the broadcast, you'll be seeing the solid rocket booster separation. And if you look very closely at the 100 millimeter thermal, you'll see four red dots for heat signatures. There's one of them right there and another and another um, as they separated from the main engine. Now, certainly capturing this directly from Hike Central doesn't give you all the detail uh, as to what I'm talking about. So I'm going to switch over in just a second and show you the video that was captured directly on the SD card in the camera with a little better detail because it's not in a four tile display within Hike Central. So watch closely now and you'll see the solid rocket booster separation from the main engine. And there you see one, two, three,
and four, all four solid rocket boosters, separating and falling, still very hot, still have a heat signature on them. And even now, we start to see the actual body of the rocket separated from the engine heat signature to the nose heat signature, where just from flying through the atmosphere at such a high speed is actually turned very hot due to the air friction. You may have also noticed the on-screen temperature indications, noticing that they're certainly not accurate. With the amount of atmosphere that we're having to go through, uh, we're not going to get an actual temperature reading of the rocket engine beyond the fact that the maximum temperature capabilities of the thermal camera as far as displaying a temperature is a little over 300, 320 degrees Fahrenheit. Now right after I was done filming the EULA launch, uh, I heard that there was going to be a SpaceX Falcon Heavy launch. Uh, it was one that had been delayed many times. The Falcon Heavy is the closest thing to the old Saturn V rockets that were used to launch all the Apollo missions. So as you can see here, I'm showing you a little bit of the live broadcast of that particular launch. was able to get up to Cape Canaveral again to record this launch as well. After multiple delays and many hours setting up and tearing down and setting up and tearing down, uh, we were able to capture this launch as well. So, let me show you what it looks like. Now unfortunately, with this being a daytime launch, it was a little more difficult just because of lighting and looking at a laptop computer monitor uh, in bright sunlight to track the SpaceX Falcon Heavy. So I apologize for some of the jumpy video, but there were some lessons learned from the EULA launch. If you notice the temperature readings that you're seeing of the SpaceX rocket are in white and certainly show up very nicely on the uh, Fusion 2 background that I'm, or Fusion 2 palette, I should say, that uh, I'm using here. And you can see it's right at that maximum temperature range of the thermal camera's capabilities, showing at about 318, 319 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's about as high as it will go. In another couple of minutes. Merlin engine performance looks good. Just like with the EULA launch, one of the nicest things to capture is the separation of the solid rocket boosters. In this case, the SpaceX Falcon Heavy has two solid rocket boosters that separate at one point and a third one that separates a little bit later. That third one is recovered on a barge out in the ocean, but in this particular case, the two solid rocket boosters actually came back and landed right at Cape Canaveral. So if you watch right now, the separation is occurring. And as you look at the thermal image, you'll start to see the thermal image starting to spread apart there as those solid rocket boosters are separating from the rocket and now lagging behind. Once they separate, they do a, a small burn, I guess, to uh, rotate them and, and basically point them back towards the launch pad area. And then these very cool fins pop out and uh, they basically drive them right back to the landing area. Everything looking good on the flight of Falcon Heavy. The next major event, main engine cutoff of the center core and separation ignition of the second stage. Now these solid rocket boosters that are coming back to Earth are not floating down by any means. They're actually um, falling at an extremely high rate of speed uh, and very, very hard to spot uh, with the naked eye. Um, but with the thermal camera, I was able to capture them a few different times. Um, but again, just because of the sunlight and the, and the laptop screen, very, very hard to track them. But uh, was actually quite amazed to see how fast they were actually traveling as they got near to the ground. Um, we picked them up just, you know, when they were just seconds from from actual landing. So um, as you watch the uh, the broadcast, it will jump forward a little bit, and there they are getting ready to land. And as you see on the thermal camera, they just look like two giant fireballs falling out of the sky, and boom, there they are. They're landed. They're on the on the landing pads right very close to where the rocket originally took off and the third solid rocket booster was recovered on the barge it was the first time that spacex managed to recover 
all three of their boosters. Just as a side note, due to rough seas, as the barge was bringing that booster back in, the robot arm that holds it uh, was not um, configured properly for that size booster. They lost it uh, to the bottom of the ocean. So as we bring this fun with thermal video to an end, well, I'll go ahead and uh, show you the view from Hike Central of the SpaceX launch with all three cameras. Uh, on the bottom we have the thermal and visible 10 millimeter bispectrum camera and on the top the 100 millimeter thermal and uh, I'm gonna speed the video up just a little bit to save you a little bit of time but we'll show it to you from the start of the launch until the recovery of the two solid rocket boosters. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your attention. If you have any questions, please reach out to your local sales engineer, our learning and development department, or product management for specific questions about thermal cameras.